Hello and welcome to another episode of Brave UX. I'm Brendan Jarvis, Managing Founder of The Space In Between, the home of New Zealand's only specialist evaluative UX research practice and world-class UX lab, enabling brave teams across the globe to de-risk product design and equally brave leaders to shape and scale design culture. You can find out a little bit more about that at thespaceinbetween.co.nz. Here on Brave UX, though, it's my job to help you to put the pieces of the product puzzle together. I do that by unpacking the stories, learnings, and expert advice of world-class UX, design, and product management professionals. My guest today is Matt Watkinson. Matt is the CEO and co-founder of Methodical, an experienced design agency that helps customer-centered businesses to develop new products and services and to improve their existing programs and experiences while delivering customer and commercial value. He is also the author of two highly regarded books, soon to be three, I'm told. His first, The Ten Principles Behind Great Customer Experiences, put Matt on the map. And his second, The Grid, The Master Model Behind Business Success, was published in 2017 to critical acclaim. Matt has been described by Rory Sutherland, the vice chairman of the Ogilvy and Mather group of companies, as one of the deepest and most original business thinkers he has ever come across. And it's this depth and originality that has seen Matt invited to share his ideas at events for companies like Microsoft, Volkswagen, Salesforce, American Express and Google. Before all the glitz and glam of his life in California, Matt was a freelance UX designer based in the United Kingdom, where he designed websites, enterprise web applications, and mobile apps for clients such as P&O Ferries, Land Rover, Vodafone, and IBM. He is an honorary senior visiting fellow at Bayes Business School in London, a venture partner at Tiller Partners in Los Angeles, and a member of the Royal Chartered Society of Designers. And now... He's kindly here with me for a conversation on Brave UX. Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for, for having me and for setting such tremendously high expectations with that introduction. <laughs> let's, see, let's see what we can do about that. That was, that was all you, Matt, not me. I just want to point out all, all of your achievements. <laughs> hey, um, uh, man, I, I was curious. Rory perhaps being a bit charitable there with his description of me, but <laughs> he is in marketing himself, so you know he knows how to sell. Yes, he does. Yes, he's a very highly regarded marketer, actually. Um, and he's also, I believe, a fellow Englishman. And I found this curious about you. So you're an, obviously there's plenty of English people that live in the States, but and you're one of them. And, you know, you're someone, as I mentioned in your introduction, known for some fairly important books in this field of customer experience. You know, you speak at highly reputable events. Uh, you've even launched your own strategic design agency and you've been invited to share your insights with America's FBI. And I did wonder, mm -hmm. you're not actually yeah, an undercover true. Kingsman or something of the, of the sort, are you? No, I'm not. Also one uh, point of, of minor pedantry, I think Rory is Welsh and I'm not sure that he takes you well to be... Uh, I will be in trouble now. As, as I hope English. you're not listening to this, Rory. Yeah, um, no, I'm not. I, I've just happened to have several pinch me moments in my career, probably as much by luck as... as as judgment. I mean, it's funny when you write a book, that first book in particular, I was 27, 28 years old, sitting at your dining table, tapping away, hoping it will see the light of day, you know, hoping that it will help people and, you know, to, to, to do a better job or, you know, the macro goal of helping people improve their customer's kind of quality of life and all of that. You really have no idea what is going to happen, whether it will die on the vine, whether it will I mean, books, even the best books can, can be a lottery, as, as, as history has taught us. You know, a lot of books have kind of come from obscurity into being million copy sellers. You know, I mean, it's a bit of a lottery. But, yeah, you, you tap away at home and you hope it's going to see the light of day. And then, you know, I was just fortunate with that first book that it got a great tailwind. It kind of arrived in the right place at the right time. And, you know, all these interesting and fascinating organizations from around the world happen to pick up on it and... You get invited to speak at a conference and then there are people in the audience who then want to hear more of what you have to say. And it just, you know, books, what they do really is they expand your kind of luck surface area. They expand your serendipity field, however you like to think about it. And it just creates more more opportunity. What those opportunities will be, you, you can never tell in advance. But yeah, I was lucky to, to, to speak at the 
at the FBI, I was lucky to. Uh, but also, you know, with conferences and events and these things, you're also fortunate to learn from people who have serious, pragmatic business challenges that, that is helping to shape your th thinking. You know, I try to avoid this sermon from the mount, I'm at the pulpit and you're here to learn from me kind of way way of speaking and approaching things and try and make it more, here's what I'm thinking about and here's the, 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 the challenges or opportunities that I've noticed. And I, I, I want to hear from you afterwards or whatever, what you have to say about that. And, and it's, it's an, as much an opportunity to learn if you approach it the right way as it is to, to share what you know. I wasn't aware that the FBI had customers. What did they want to learn from you? Well, uh, that's a very good question, and you're not the first person to, to, to ask it, actually, because it does sound a little bit incongruous. But there are entire parts of the agency, which is quite large, that are there to serve other parts. If you think about their uh, IT and technology function, obviously, they have a lot of people who depend on them. If you're at a field office or out in the field or whatever, and you have an issue with technology, you have, you know, they're, they're serving their internal customer in, in, in that regard. They also have to, you know, they relate with the, the public. There's a lot of citizen outreach. There's all, all sorts of things. So, yeah, they have a mix of, uh, and also other agencies that, that, that they work with or co collaborate with. So, you know, they're uh, obviously an extremely impressive organization. I think they have, I mean, it's something insane, like a thousand or 10,000 applicants for every role that's open or, or, or something like that. Very impressive well-run, highly professional organization. And it was a, a privilege to be invited to the Hoover building and, and, and have a conversation with some of the people who worked there. I understand you were also invited to a, another famous building after that talk. Yes, the White House, yeah, which was quite funny. My business partner and I, Ben, put, I've got a photo of it actually, put the White House in the sat-nav on our hire car and drove over there. It's a pretty funny <laughs> thing to pretty funny thing to see. Yeah, I mean we just had a, a like a, a run of the mill tour. It wasn't like a, anything out of the ordinary, but it was a kind of surreal moment. I mean I'm from a I'm from like a crap town in England. Ben's from Dunedin, where, you know, in your your neck of the woods. You know, with these two kind of village idiots basically showing up at the <laughs> showing up at the the Hoover building at the White House. It was pretty it's pretty entertaining for us, but yeah. If people are listening from Reading in England, uh, Matt's just described uh, your your place of birth or residence as a crap town. You, you'll never well, be able to go back now. <laughs> I'm trying to think of its redeeming features. I'm sure there are some, but uh, uh, I mean, it's just a town. I mean, there's it's nothing... thirty minutes from Oxford, you know. So maybe that's a redeeming feature. Yeah, and there's a rock festival every year, which is amazing. All the best, like amazing bands are played there. So. Yeah, I mean, Reading's just kind of nondescript. It's a bit uncharitable to call it crap. I've heard people call it worse, but... So thinking about Great Britain, and again, sorry, Rory, if you are listening, apologies. I uh, used to have a, a Welsh girlfriend, and I know exactly how deep that must cut to be accused of being English. Anyway, back to the UK. Clearly some big events have happened in the UK recently, uh, most notably the passing of Queen Elizabeth II. I was interested in your views on the British monarchy from an experience design perspective. My views on the monarchy from an experienced design perspective. Mm, given what we just saw with the funeral and how this whole momentous and historic changing of, of regent has just played out. Well, I mean, I really have no idea how to answer that. I didn't, I don't typically read the news and I don't have television. I mean, it is in incredible. I, I tell you, I did have a conversation with one of my one of my uh, partners um, the other night, in fact, the guy who runs Tiller Partners, Chava Conkoy, who I wrote this third book with that's coming out about longevity is impressive in, in any kind of organization or any kind of business or any kind of brand. And it might be a bit cynical to call the royal family a, a business or a brand or, or, or anything like that. I don't mean well, to. Well, they call themselves the firm, don't they? So I'm yeah. well, vernacular. I'm not, I'm not intentionally, yeah, I'm not intentionally <laughs> being a being disrespectful if it comes across that way, but they have had tremendous longevity and they've continued to try and reshape themselves into being relevant and resonating with with modern with 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 the changing of the of the times. Some people would argue that they've done that very well. I think some people would argue that it's that they haven't. I don't have a particularly strong opinion on it either way, but they, they do seem to have maintained their relevance and appeal to people who want to visit the, 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 the country and to huge swathes of the population. So, you know, well done, well done then. 
I can't think of many people in this day and age that could die and attract degree of emotion and the calibre of attendees to their funeral. It really, and I know you said you didn't follow it. <clears throat> I didn't watch mm. it, but I did follow it uh, to some degree through the headlines, and it mm. was uh, spectacular. So they're, they're certainly they're doing something right as far as their positioning and the and the hearts and minds of people globally. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I would, I would concur. I would concur. So there's something else that, well, something we share in common actually that is related to the British Isles that I briefly wanted to touch on. And I'm a novice when it comes to this, but I understand that you're quite, quite the expert, or at least further on than I am. And I'm talking okay. about Scotch whiskey. I understand you're right. a bit of a collector. How many bottles do you have in your collection? Uh, well. I've killed a few recently. I'd estimate between, <laughs> I'm going to guess somewhere between 80 and 100. Mm. So not nothing outrageous, but it captures people's attention when they, they come in the living room and see the cart. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's a lot of booze. I'm like, well, that's just, that's just scotch. I mean, that, or, or with some Japanese. Uh, but, but yeah, I do, uh, I am partial to a scotch every now and then. And what is it about scotch and the culture or the experience that sits around scotch that has it has sort of pulled you towards it or keeps you engaged with it? Well, it appeals to me in, in, in several distinct ways. Okay, so I think one, like on a, in a kind of pragmatic, experiential way, I think owing to the kind of complexity of the of the of the drink, it's an opportunity to slow down and kind of be a bit present in the moment like you don't kind of glug it it's not a fuel source it's not it is an opportunity to just take a beat and savor savor an experience and and be kind of in that in that particular moment and just give yourself a little bit of you time to to just in, enjoy something you know and 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 there's no um there's no pret- pretense or pretentiousness with that I, sh- I should say because some some of the whiskies that I I enjoy are very inexpensive. I don't have anything that's that's stratospherically expensive either. Another good thing I think, as you as your palate develops with Scotch, is that you start to hunt value for money. So, like there are some whiskies that are just famously overpriced, and there are alternatives that have the same flavor profile and comparable quality that are a fraction of the, the price. And there's a lot of there's a degree of pleasure that comes from from that kind of insider knowledge. Like I would say. I mean, some people would disagree, but like a Glendronach whiskey is comparable, if not superior, to a lot of Macallan whiskies. But it's it's, it's not as not as expensive. So, you know, that's not a ding against Macallan. They're tremendous, and their brand building is amazing. They're like the kind of Rolex of of, of whiskey, I guess. They've built this incredible brand. But in terms of pure flavor, if you were to blind taste it, I, it's delicious. But it's delicious and expensive, and there are other things that are delicious and less expensive. I think also it's a kind of counterpoint to 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 a lot of a lot of the things that I like in my life are counterpoints to my work life, right? So work is can be frenetic and fast paced, and kind of everything is ethereal and, and iterative. Certainly in the digital space, there's, there's not a lot that's kind of tangible or real. Sometimes I have this this dread feeling that you could delete a hard drive and my career wouldn't exist. You know, I don't know whether other other people ever ever s- struggle with that that notion. People who work in the digital space, but I'm I kind of have an analog heart. Like I'm drawn to real things, to objects, to to buildings, to to tangible things, machines. I love machines and watches and cameras and all, all that kind of stuff. And one of the things about whiskey is that it just takes a fucking long time to make it right. Like. It's aged, and it's aged because it's the the flavor is imparted through a kind of alchemical process of sitting in a wooden barrel that's breathing, right? And air is passing in and out of it, and it's expanding and contracting with the temperature and its physical location. It might be by the sea, it might be in a cave, it might be high up somewhere dry, it might be in in the tropics if you talk about a distillery like Kavalan in, in Taiwan, and it's kind of slow and alchemical and organic and it's an kind of an art and i those things have an an appeal f- for me just as in terms of my own my own personality or my own persona i like all i like all of those things about it and uh, it's sociable and it's and it's fun and um yeah it's just a nice way to end 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 a, a busy day for me 
That quality, that analog quality, it almost to me speaks to an old worldness, if you like, things like the motorbikes that you work on, the mm -hmm. you know, the cameras that you have, the things that exist outside of our screens, which we spend a exorbitant amount of time in front of. Has this pull towards the analog always been something that's been part of your life or is this something that you've developed as a response to the magnetization that exists around the devices that we spend so much of our day in front of? I think I've always had a very, um, well, I mean, it's kind of a stupid thing to say. I love things, but I hate stuff. I don't know if that's even possible. Here, here's a, a way of trying to answer that question. My, my dad was, a, was a, an engineer and, and an industrial designer, and he ran a firm that, that um, created professional audio products, which he's since sold. But I remember being 12, 13, maybe 14 years old and going around to his business partner's house. He had one of these Bang & Olufsen stereos where if you put your hand in front of it, the, these glass doors would slide apart and the lights would come on. Like this warm light would kind of emanate from it. And then you'd press a button and it would lift a clamp and that's how you put the compact disc in. I actually got one. It's just out of the frame. And even though it's defunct, it's uh, so of sentimental value for me. I remember seeing this this thing and and saying, how do you, it's behind these doors. How does it work? And he's like, well, walk up to it. And I walked up to it and I extended my, my arm and the glass doors opened. And it was like this light bulb went off in my mind that we could be intentional about the effect of a product on the user of it or the customer of it. Like it was somebody's job or somebody's vision or somebody's idea to make this thing playful, right? And to make it engaging and to make it something that just provided a little shot of, of pleasure during the day. It took something that was mundane and elevated it with this kind of theatrical, kind of slightly whimsical way of, of interacting with it. And I think when I, when I realized that as a kind of teenager, that was when my love for, for design was, was cemented. You know, I became aware of it as a discipline, if that makes sense. And I became aware that we had a response to the objects in our in environment and the things that we used and the tools that we use and the products that we own. And that by being intentional about that, by being thoughtful about that, um, you know, Stephen Bailey, who's a wonderful design critic, once said, "Design is intelligence made made visible." You know, I, and I really like I really like that. I, I think that you know, th thoughtfulness is is a is a virtue in in product in product design. And so, yeah, this kind of uh, and and I also think that the you know the machines and things which I I, I love engineering all of that stuff is. Yeah, it is intelligence made made visible, and I get a I get a real kick out of it, and I and I love it, and I love that people can say we're going to make something great, and it's going to stand the test of time, and it's going to provide years of if not joy, functional performance to somebody, and it's going to solve solve a need or bring them some kind of of joy and 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 delight, and I just wanted to be part of that world, and 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 I think everyone who works in in design, whether in, in and all the various disciplines thereof are, are that resonates with them. I think we're all like that. I think a lot of people who are UX UI guys would be really happy as a architect or as a or some some other thing. Like we're all kind of turned on by the same things, or or a lot of us are, at least in my experience. And you know, I don't. Maybe it's my that I was kind of the last generation of people who were born pre digital being normal. Like I grew up without the internet grew up without iPhone, grew up like building, building like shelters out of sticks in the woods and like falling off my BMX and riding around on a skateboard and building airfix kits with my dad and radio controlled Tamiya cars. Something I've been, which I still slightly nerdy, but I still love all of that kind of thing. I just love making things, you know, I love making things. And, and I also think that, you know, to try and bring that back to a UX UI conversation, when I got into that, that discipline, there weren't many degrees of separation between you and people who were making things. It was one or it was none. Often you were making it yourself. And I think that one of the things that separates great design professionals and, and you know, those who perhaps can develop their skills is more of an appreciation of how things are made and more consideration for the making of things during the design process. And that's why you hear people like Johnny Ive always talking about the art of making. You know, he's a designer, but he's interested in making. Mark Newson is, is capable of making things and is fascinated by, by materials, you know. And, and the, the, the final thing about this, I'm aware this is becoming an extended 
monologue is that my personal projects, the side projects that I've been involved in, building motorcycles, take a lot of photos, obviously writing books is not really a side project, but it's not my day job uh, these days. These are opportunities to indulge things to the quality level that you personally would like to see them done to. And that's not always the case with client work, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for, for less good reasons. But I think a lot of people in creative fields are frustrated by by some of these um, constraints that are imposed on them. And as uh, Scott Belsky wrote, he wrote a wonderful book, The Messy Middle, some of the best projects, many of the best projects are slow cooked, like the best food is slow cooked. And so having these things outside of your, your, your field of work that you can slow cook, you can slow cook building a motorcycle, you can slow cook writing a book, you can, you can slow cook a personal project and, and get it to the point where you go, that's just right. Like that's just right for me and it's my vision and that's all that matters and I don't have a customer, so they can fuck off. They don't like it, frankly. Like having that opportunity... Uh, is 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 fantastic for me, and that's why I'm always tinkering or making things on on the side. You mentioned UX design, and as I mentioned in your introduction, just eleven short years ago, you were a UX designer and involved in purely, from what it sounds like anyway, digital projects. Yeah. You're also someone who is fairly curious and that I also learned from something that you'd said that you didn't get your university entrance, but you did end up going to university and, um, and getting a degree. Mm-hmm. You're also not a business person. And you mentioned a little earlier on as well that you were around 26 or 27 when you wrote your first book. So I was thinking about these attributes of your person and your history and your experience. And I was thinking, you know, what business was it of yours, someone who wasn't a business person, to write a book about customer experience and essentially business at the core of that at that age of 26 or 27? Well, you know, the best thing about writing a book when you're 26, 27, 28 is that you already know everything, you know, which makes everything <laughs> easier. <laughs> it's, only, uh, it's only when you get a bit older that you realise that that might not be true. Um, Anything you want to retract in the book at this stage? Oh, well, I mean, that's a great question. My my take on on the Ten Principles book, not that I've read it for a really long time, is that the ten guidelines hold up remarkably well. In, in my opinion, I think they they do. I would change the emphasis of of some of them because some of them have shown to be bigger issues or or, or lesser issues than others. And I would I would reframe some of the business opportunities slightly differently. And I think obviously with a decade of more experience as a writer, I think I'd be I'd find my own writing abhorrent and have to write from scratch. <laughs> or just like heavily there'd be so much red pen flying around that thing. Uh, if I went into to do a, a second I was gonna say version then, edition. If I was gonna do a second edition of it, I would I would maintain the the, the, the core of it because it's it's helped a lot of people. And it's done really well. I mean, it it won. It's, it, I think it's still the only book on customer experience to win a major award. It's won Management Book of the Year. But but you know, I've learned and grown, and I've been wrong as often as I've been right in the last in the ten years since. So yeah, there's there's a load of things that I would change, but I probably wouldn't change the ten core tenets of it. I think they've held up remarkably well. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm 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 proud of that. You know, that was. That was that worked out well. But to, to answer the question about like do, like well, did I have a, a the right to write it? I guess and that's that's a very good good question because I I just observed and, and this came again from growing up with my my dad that, that every serious discipline had a, had a set of principles that allowed people to make decisions more efficiently and more effectively or guidelines right like you wouldn't expect someone at Boeing who's an engineer to not know that force is mass times acceleration right I mean you'd expect them to 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 know that and and several far more complicated things that I wouldn't understand. But I just thought, look, here we are. We're trying to get the experiential component of products or services right or the customer experience right. And if we just had these like simple universal guidelines that we could use as a mental scaffolding, which is a term I use a lot to to describe how I like to approach things, then we could not like not guarantee success because you, you never can but we'd have better hypotheses to work from or we'd have better guidelines to help us make make decisions right so we know like the trajectory of, of products and services is easier tends to win right it doesn't always win but it tends to win if you think about commu- how communication has evolved in the last 15 20 years from the fax machine through to whatsapp and 
you know, we don't even text anymore. We just emoji or Siri does it for us, whatever. It's in it's in the direction of convenience and ease. There's there's no denying that, and almost every product or service is in that trajectory, right? So launching something that is functionally identical but noticeably harder to use than alternatives is the odds of success are much diminished, right? I think we'd agree with that. But but knowing these principles around like error prevention, feedback, choice paralysis reducing time on task, all of that kind of stuff allows you to be structured and intentional in the design of those things to achieve that that goal and not leave it to chance perhaps so much. So yeah, that, that was why I, I did it because I saw the opportunity to make that kind of thinking accessible to a, a very broad audience. And I put the yards in to do the research. You know, I did about three years of, of research to kind of come up with this set of, of, of principles. And I think that's given it this kind of evergreen quality that people still, I mean, even up until last year, people, I mean, I haven't looked at the numbers now, some people ordering a thousand copies at a time for conferences or events and things. So yeah, maybe I didn't have the right to write it, but it worked out pretty well anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it did. It sounds like you might've been a little sick of having the same kinds of conversations with people. What, about the book? No, not about the book, more about the, the way in which we approach the, the design of these experiences. So, I mean, the way that I thought about it is, is and I, I still use this when I talk about the book, I read this uh, book by Miyamoto Musashi, The Book of Five Rings, which was a kind of samurai training manual, not that that's necessarily relevant to my day job, but he was talking about the difference between a strike and a hit, and a, and a strike being something that's a conscious, considered and deliberate action or technique that's kind of been mastered to the point where you can perform that with a consistent outcome. And a hit is kind of swinging your arms around, hoping that you're going to land that knockout blow on your opponent. And I just felt that the way that we were approaching this whole CX thing felt a lot more like hitting than striking, uh, that, that there was an opportunity there to bring some kind of body of theoretical knowledge to it in an accessible, non-academic uh, format. So that's what I, I set out to do. You've said, and I'll quote you now, my practice has been shaped by a conscious awareness of my ignorance rather than a conscious awareness of my strengths. What was it that you experienced? Maybe someone said something to you or you did something. What was it that made you conscious and aware of your own ignorance? I mean, everything. <laughs> everything would be the, would be the, the easy answer. I, let me give you one, one example of this. So the the way that my well the way that my career has played out is that I've tried to solve a problem uh, through things like let's just talk about the first book for example I tried to solve a problem by doing by writing that book okay and what that that did was unintentionally it kind of put me in this position where people would contact me and they'd be much more senior than the people I'd normally be used to dealing with and they'd want me to talk about much more kind of strategic matters or big picture matters nobody wanted to pay me to sketch wireframes anymore they just wanted me to drink coffee and pontificate and point at slides right which was an extremely disorientating and uncomfortable time in, in in my career because i didn't have a plan for that i just thought i'll carry on doing what i'm doing and maybe i'll earn a little bit more and it'll be cool and i get to say hey i wrote a book but that that's not really how it, sh how it shook out but what came out from those conversations was people as like People would say, well, you know, we're going to spend this money on this CX program. We have this CX problem. And I'd be like, well, what? what makes you think that you have that problem? How do you know you don't have a product problem or a pricing problem or, a, or an awareness problem? Or like, it just seemed to me that like they'd arrived at the solution without, without realizing the problem, right? So that then set, would, would set me off down a different kind of intellectual trajectory of wanting to learn, well, how do we go about doing that? And realizing I don't actually know how we how we do that. Right? How do we diagnose the problems that we, that we have in the first place, right? So that, again, in solving every challenge or attempting to solve a challenge, you become aware of your, the boundaries of your knowledge and then you start to expand it and, and, and doing progressive cycles of, oh, okay, I think I've cracked this. Oh, shit, that's revealed this. Like, is bringing into your awareness con continuously the, the limits to your knowledge and, and, and understanding, right? So that's one aspect of it, which is that, you know, your own personal growth if you read a lot and you study a lot, is always you're always going to be butting up at the edge of your of your capabilities and competence. So that's part of it. The other part of it is that occasionally you come across something that, that upends your worldview and, and the antibodies in your mind want to reject it. Right? They're like, that can't be right. That's got to be nonsense. Like, how can that possibly be true if this is also true and I believe that? Right. So 
A great example of this would be, uh, it's probably on the shelf behind me. Oh, it's just one, one shelf up, you can't see it. The, the work of the Ehrenberg Bass Institute and Byron Sharp in, uh, captured in the books How Brands Grow Part 1 and 2, where they're like, okay, we've got far too much of a focus on loyalty and not enough of a focus on acquisition. Typically, there's all these concepts like the heavy buyer fallacy, double jeopardy, blah, 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 blah. You know, differentiation is kind of questionable. Like all of these concepts. And I was like, this cannot, like I was raised to believe exactly the opposite, right? But that is, that book for sure revealed my ignorance because he's, they are, they have the strongest evidence and I believe them to be right, for want of a better term. I believe them to be correct, and and I've been applying those those principles um, in my in my own work, and I've I've seen the results from it. Right now, a lot of people in the customer experience space don't want to change their mind about that. They they literally they they re- in fact some people who I've had conversations with about this where I've said you can't you almost can't in good conscience continue with the way in which you're operating your business if you know this to be untrue. And that this is true. So you need to read this book. And there's like, but I don't want to, so I'm not going to. Yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of that. I think strong be- strong beliefs loosely held is a good way of approaching things. I've been wrong so often, or I've had my eyes open to new ways of doing things so often, or I've had colleagues of mine that I've hired point out better ways of doing things in our own company so often that I have all the evidence that I need to assume that I might be I might well be wrong about what I'm talking about and I'm, and be open to somebody saying, no, 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 that doesn't work. I mean, my my th- new book coming out with, with Chabba, who I mentioned earlier, I mean, learning from him, this is a guy who's backed 27 startups, five of which are worth a billion each now, seven of which are worth a billion in, in aggregate. He's tremendously successful entrepreneur and, in, and investor. The way that he makes decisions is totally different to mine. And I, I couldn't put my finger on it until it, I eventually realized that it was his relationship with uncertainty. Like I was just trying to always continuously analyze risk and uncertainty out of the picture to make better decisions. That's what I thought making better decisions looked like. He was always like, it doesn't work like that. Like the, the future is unknowable. The world is unpredictable. Everything is uncertain. What you need to do is play a numbers game and they work on the basis of like affordable loss instead of trying to guarantee a return on investment. And, I, and as I started learning about all these concepts, it just exploded my brain, you know. Mm. And you, you've said about this, I'll quote you again, you've said there's no harm in changing your mind. We're all learning every day. I spoke with uh, Christina Vodka uh, a couple of weeks ago and she echoed a similar sentiment to me. She basically said that changing a position that you've previously held is not a sign of weakness. It's actually an indication that you've learned something. Now, this is what you've talked about here, this aspects of what you've talked about. So things with being more comfortable with risk, being willing to be wrong, being open to being coached, these types of attitudes or mindsets or behaviors are not ubiquitous. They're not things that everybody is comfortable embracing. What is it that you think from your observations of other people and perhaps your own observation of yourself, what is it that you think gets in the way of people taking this posture and unlocking more potential for themselves? I think there are several several factors involved. I think one of them is our general, in at least in terms of my experience of my upbringing in education, the belief that there are, like, in terms of our education, we go through a curriculum and we're, we're examined on things where there are right and wrong answers. And you score points for getting good answers and you lose points for getting bad answers, right? So you're inculcating a mentality in people that there's a correct answer and I must find the correct answer and that's where I get a pat on the head and if I don't get the correct answer, I get a red, I get the red pen. Well, business and the real world is not like that. It's not like taking a geography exam or a maths test. There are there are often many, many right answers, and there are often many, many wrong answers, and there are often factors in the environment that can mean that even if you answer it wrong, you still win, <laughs> and even if you answer it right, you still lose. Right. So, first of all, having that that mindset of there's a right and wrong answer is unhelpful in business and people aren't ever taught that, right? Like when I think about people who go for job interviews and I've raised this several times with people, you know, if someone doesn't get the job, they assume it's because they weren't good. But when you think about how many factors are in your control versus aren't in your control with a job interview, like, well, what mood the interviewer is in, 
Have I got good chemistry with them? If they already decided on an internal hire and this is just a dog and pony show, what's their exact hiring criteria? What's the politics? Who else was I interviewing against? Like the, the list of factors beyond your control vastly outweighs the factors within your control. So you, the, the, the rational thing to do would be to say, well, this was a numbers game and my numbers didn't come up. And if you prepared well, and if you gave your best shot and you weren't late and you were vaguely cogent and you weren't drunk and all those things that you should do for an interview, don't beat yourself up about it, right? But, but people's concept of success and failure is so fucking binary. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is that there's, um, there's definitely a kind of ego dimension to it in, in, in my experience. We all have one. Right? We all, nobody loves to be criticized, right? Or nobody loves instinctively for it to be pointed out where we got things wrong or where we can improve. I mean, you can learn to love it. I think I've learned to love it, which is why I, I literally have coaches and mentors for everything that I'm, I'm interested in, partially because I'm too lazy to learn everything the hard way, but partially because I... I I believe like the easiest way to get better at something is to find an expert, ask them what to do and do it. Not like find an idiot, ask them what to do and do it, or find an expert, tell them what to do and do it, or find an expert, ask them what to do and do something else. Like those things just don't work. I think you like, that's how I, how I learn. I find an expert, I ask them what to do and I, and I do it. But I think there's an ego com component to it, which is, wow, that hurt. But rather than saying, okay, that hurts, but I can live with a little bit of pain and just move on. It's like, no, that hurts and I don't want to be hurt. So I'm not going to put myself in a situation where it hurts. Like, it's fine. Just toughen up. You'll get through it. And then I think the third thing is just fear, fear, like a, a, a kind of sense of fear. And I don't know whether it's real or imagined because I don't, I'm not employed. So I, I, I don't have that much exposure to what employees go, go through. But it's like, how are people going to react when they discover that I'm wrong, or if I admit that I made a mistake, or I admit, if I, it's, it's more like the forward thinking aspect of how you're going to be judged, I think can, can, can tyrannize people. And that, you know, comes down, I think, to, you know, issues around culture and leadership and, and management and, and, and that kind of thing. I actually think like Ray Dalio had something really good to say about this, where in terms of their culture, uh, uh, Bridgewater, I think it's called, it's like, it's okay to make mistakes, but it's not okay not to learn from them. And it's definitely not okay to cover them up. Like you, 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 you're going to get in trouble for those, but you're not going to get in trouble for, for making the, the mistake. You know, so I, yeah, I think those are the kind of big components of it. And also some people, you know, you know some people just don't want to get better at things. Like they're happy. They're happy in their, and that's cool. You know, they're just happy doing what they're doing the way that they're doing it. And they're happy. And if that's what they're after, that's that's cool. Like there's no, you know, everyone's got to live life on their own terms in the way that, that they find fulfilling. Yeah. Are you familiar with Marshall Goldsmith's work? I'm not. There's a book that he wrote probably over a decade ago now. So he's a leadership coach for some of, as you can imagine, some of the world's most uh, hard-charging types of people, people like the head of the World Bank, the CEO of Pfizer, you know, these kind of people. He wrote a book called What Got You here won't get you there. Uh, maybe it's 15, 20 years old now. And I heard him recently interviewed and he had this interesting thing to say about the stories that we tell ourselves, particularly when we fail at doing something, you know, the, the beat up that can happen in one's mind, uh, the beration mm -hmm. and how that limits our ability to accept future risks and, and to learn and to grow. And he's a practicing Buddhist, not a, um, not a spiritual Buddhist. And he has this this practice of basically just every time you breathe in and you breathe out, it's a new you. And mm. I found that internalizing that has been really useful, particularly in those moments where you, where, where, where you, meaning me in this case, where I've caught myself having that unhelpful conversation and recognizing and kind of getting some objectivity on the outcome and you talked about that you don't always have control of all the circumstances. In fact, you probably never do. So it is, there are, there are these, these things that people can do, these practice, practices they can pick up that can help them with becoming more okay uh, with the fact that things aren't going to play out perfectly and that life doesn't work like a test. Sure. And, you know, one thing that's really helped me with, with some of that, there's a wonderful book, actually. I really love this book. I called Josh Waitskin, The Art of Learning, where he says, actually, often it's not the first mistake that 
causes the problem. It's that if you can't get hold of yourself after the first mistake, things unravel, you make a second mistake and a third mistake, and that's when things really start to go awry. And one of the things that's really helped me with that is um, riding riding bikes on the track. Because if you can you can make a mistake, you have kind of two choices, right? Let's say like I get my turn-in point wrong, or I get my entry speed to a corner wrong, or I pick the throttle up wrong, or I run wide on the corner or, or something, right? The lap is still recoverable in terms of the, the lap time or or your your feeling about it. But if your headspace goes, if your inner monologue starts talking to you and you're replaying the last corner, you can't simultaneously be clear-headed and focused enough to in the approach to to the rest of the of the track. You have to let it go. Otherwise otherwise things unravel real real fast for you for you. So like mm. just having something too, right? well hopefully not. I mean, I think the track is a pretty, pretty safe environment. Certainly, way safer than the road is. But you, um, you, uh, yeah, you, you need to just find, like, breathe, as you say, like, let it go, look to the next thing. I think having having things in life where you have to learn those skills in order to to succeed. I mean, I learned so much from building bikes and and riding them, like, because it's a high. The consequences are high, right? Like, you learn patience when you build a machine that explodes petrol between your legs <laughs> like you, you you learn you learn about patience and and self-discipline and you learn like i should check the torque value on that bolt before i tighten it up i i should double check that i've put my brake discs on correctly and the wheel is on the right way around like i should check that i've like you you learn and i'm not saying that everybody should get into building and racing or riding motorcycles far far from it like you do whatever you want but i think there's something great in that discipline that those disciplines that i've been able to transfer to other parts of my life about oh i have to slow down i have to be patient i can't rush this i can't do this in a frame of mind where i can't concentrate like because the consequences of it are, are of failure are, are, are really high and i find that there are so many aspects of life where i've like started to just do that like I, i'm pretty sure that i didn't chew my food until this year like i think i just like stuck it in my mouth and s- swallowed it right like and then I, I i met this nutritionist who said here's what i want you to do i want you to put your fork down between every mouthful and see what happens and i was like okay and difference is amazing in terms of the taste sensation in terms of how you you digest in terms of like flatulence, <laughs> in terms of everything, basically, like just slowing down and not being like, I'm trying to eat this and I'm trying to watch this webinar and I'm trying to get ready for this meeting and I've got to be out the door and I'm thinking about blah, 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 blah. Like just slowing down and saying, this is the task at hand and I'm going to focus on the task at hand, whether that's talking a, a motorcycle axle or eating a carrot. It, it is a big change in quality of life and in in actual performance of of of, of tasks, in, and that's something that I'm learning like right now in at 39 years old. Like, clear your mind before you tackle something important, and give it the time and attention that it requires. And that could be eating a meal, or that could be rehearsing a presentation, or that could be that could literally be anything. Or drinking a whiskey, like we were talking or about just earlier. Drinking, drinking, uh, drinking a whiskey. I'm eyeing my cart over there as we. It's as too we early, about. Matt. It's too early. It is, and I've got to actually get on the bike after this, so uh, I definitely will be having a, having a drink. And this takes a degree of intentionality, you know, to put your fork down in between every mouth to savor the moment when you're sipping on a dram, you know, to mm-hmm. pay close attention to tightening that bolt when you're building a motorcycle. How close by is your phone when you're engaging in these activities? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, uh, I struggle with that, I think, as much as anybody does. Um, it's, it's funny because when I do, there are some things that just naturally kind of put me in that flow state that we, that we often hear about where I just don't, like time flies and I don't even consider looking at my at my phone and there are some times where it's a real battle because I'm not really engaged with what I'm doing and I'm bored and it's just constantly there bing bing bong distracting you kind of thing I do yeah I do try to keep it at arms 
and length or beyond when I'm working on, on certain things. Or I just try and set the environment up in a way that I mentally change gears for the task at hand. So like in my in my little uh, garage workshop where I where I've been building this Honda recently, me and a, a good friend of mine uh, were just putting the finishing touches on this this bike, and it's the important stuff: wheels, tires, and brakes. You know, there are things where it, it can be terminal if you make a mistake. And so, like, we've set up the environment in a very particular way. First of all, invite somebody else as a second pair of eyes to just four eyes better than two. That's a big lesson with anything really important. Just someone to spot you. Second, like, take a deep breath when you go in there and get yourself calm and intentionally set a work rate where you're like, I could do this for hours. You know, that's it. That's something I learned from writing my books as well. It's like, I can write from seven till noon or a thousand good words a day. That's me done. I can't do more than that without compromising the next day. So like do that. And then it's like, put on some relaxing, non-distracting music. I listen to a lot of Bach. I listen to a lot of Beethoven. People hear it coming out of the garage and see these ludicrous like super bikes in there and think, who is this? But <laughs> it, it like it it helps me just like clear my palate mentally, mm. if that's not too mixed a, 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 a metaphor. It almost sounds like be, a ritual. Yeah, yeah. Like I I fully believe in the value of rituals, personal rituals to get you into a headspace to to perform. But I have rituals before I speak. I have rituals at kind of conferences and things. Rituals in every morning. Uh, rituals before I start working on a on anything that's kind of high high consequence. I I and and a lot of other people do, and I think that I would encourage people to to kind of develop those for themselves as a shortcut to getting into the state that you want to be in to perform. Would you say that it's almost a focusing tool for being present in the moment? Like this is almost about how do you get outside your head a little bit and just tend to what it is that's at hand? Yeah, so, you know, I, like probably a billion other people, have have been kind of drawn into or tangentially heard about these things like the power of now and the mindfulness movement. I've met Andy Puddicombe from Headspace, who's a really lovely, really lovely guy. Met him a, a couple of times and been fortunate to have some really good conversations with him. Uh, I also read recently a wonderful book on this. It's called The Happiness Trap, um, which relates directly to this kind of like, mental chatter and constantly getting drawn backwards or, or forwards. I, I've always like thought it's a bit, I don't know, glib, for want of a better word, just say, oh, just be in the moment. And like, well, I can't just be in the moment because I have to anticipate what's going to happen in the future. And I can't just be in the moment because I also have to learn from things that have happened in the past. And it's like, I, I felt like it was too simplistic. It lacked nuance to say, we just have to be in the, in the moment, man. Like it didn't, doesn't... But too California be, happy. Yeah, but yeah, and like, well, okay, I also have to save for the future because I might not be able to work. I also have to have insurance because I might crash my car i also you know like it just felt a bit too like okay whatever but but at the same time i do believe that it's something that most of us are, are lacking is an ability to to be present in the in the in the moment like either because we're like oh that's interesting while we're looking at our phones or like even just listening is difficult it's actually a skill like nancy klein I wrote a great book on this, Time to Think. In fact, listening, the way in which we listen, affects other people's ability to think. Because if you're talking, and instead of me actively listening to you, I'm like just waiting for my turn to talk, or I'm trying to interrupt you, or I'm trying to complete your sentences for you. That's like speeding up your thinking process because you're trying to get it out before like the, the bald guy interrupts you, which is mm. and annoys you kind of thing. Mm. That's so that's like affecting your, your mm. yeah, it's like not chewing your food. Like that's affecting your ability to think as well. So we all think better if we listen better and we can only listen better if we're actually just trying to be there with the person at the right time. I'm not great at this. I'm getting, I'm getting better at it and I'm, I'm trying to get, get, get better at it. But all of these things about just being like being present in, in the moment are, the the I th I feel like the modern world is set against you, and and you you have to fight for it. But it's it's a worthy it's a worthy fight. Like I don't have my so, I have one example. I have my phone in the bedroom when I go to sleep. It's always uh, in the kitchen, which 
because I like like a billion other people would wake up in the morning and go, oh, what's happened? You know, especially because I've got friends in England or whatever, you know, there would be something to wake up to. So having it in the, in the kitchen and not switching it off airplane mode until I've actually done the things that are important to center myself in the morning is a little thing that, that I found makes a big a big difference. I feel like I'm straying into like self-help guru territory here, which is not at all my sphere of, of expertise. But, you know, I um, th- those kinds of things, I think everybody struggles with it. I struggle with it. And it's it's something that we've just got to kind of take ownership of and say, like, wow, life is short. And do I want to look back on it and say, wow, I spent seven hours on Instagram today. Like, that's why I don't have any of that social media stuff, because it's like catnip for me. I can't can't control myself like mm. i have to not have it because i know that i can't i just get like sucked in, in into it so i have to not have it it's been designed that way which i'm sure you knew uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it has. speaking of your speaking of expertise so let's talk about something that is directly in your wheelhouse of expertise and that is this notion of problem solving within organizations and you've said about this that coordination is our biggest challenge, not competence. And so when I take this into the context of creating creating digital products and services, you know, so we've got mm-hmm. people in product, people in design, people in engineering. And, you know, you spoke about listening just a few moments ago. You know, people are doing a lot of talking. Perhaps the listening to talking ratio isn't quite what it should be. What have you found through your work with Methodical, with a range of different large and smaller organizations, but people being the common thread here, what have you found works when helping to coordinate those various areas of specialty, you know, to help people to take a breath, to stop talking, start listening and start integrating or understanding before they then start integrating the perspectives of those other experts that are in the room? Mm, Well, that's a... That's a big question. It's, it's also a great question, actually. I think so. One of the there is a, a big difference between a big company and a small company. Like big is not small, but bigger. Big is fundamentally different. And and I think it's because you know this is all kind of laid out in loon shots. If you've read that book, um, it's because the social structure of the organisation is different. Like there's no payoff for, for political decision making in a business of methodical size. Right, we're too small. You're not going to get a promotion. You're not going to get a corner office. You're not going to curry favor with the boss. You're going to, it doesn't work like that because we're, we're a minnow. Like as startup companies, you either do a good job or you your business dies and you can't feed your family, you know, worst case scenario. So everyone is just focused on doing a good job with the product or the service and they're not focused on how's Marjorie going to react to this. You know, you don't have the option. And that ultimately, I think, is why big companies are always displaced by smaller ones on an upward trajectory. Because when you're in a large organization, the the benefits of, um, as uh, Safi Bakal, I think his name is, in Loon Shots, like the benefits of rank and playing politics and those kinds of things can outweigh the benefits of doing what's in your customer's interest or your business's interest because there's so much insulation between you and your decision making and cause and effect and the success of the firm and how people feel about that in a macro view like it can be more astute in terms of your personal success to be a politician or to be that might be overstating it to be politically astute in your decision making um, because the the environment rewards that right and that's not by the way, just to be clear on that, that's not in any way a criticism of any large organization because I think it's a natural phenomenon. Right? I, I, I wouldn't say that the people who, who make those kinds of decisions are, they're responding to the environment that they're in right? and they're making the best decisions in the environment that they're in. I, I would never criticize somebody for doing those, those things because it's, it's human nature, it's natural and it's the environment that we've, that we've created that promotes that kind of of decision making, you have a large scale social structure as much as you have an operational one, and it's it's inevitable, right? I think it's inevitable, which is why I think a lot of companies that are very design led or are visionary have a basically a kind of dictator at the helm who says this is what we're doing. Oh, you don't like it? Goodbye. 
You know, that's not to say they're not receptive to feedback. That's not we're saying that they they don't want to to grow and develop, but they're not trying to have a consensus led organization. They're trying to make something awesome, and that's what they want want to do, right? I think of, I mean, not that I know any of these people individually, but certainly the jobs I've combo, I would say that there was very strong borderline dictatorial leadership from from Steve Jobs. I would say the Musks of the world, you know, perhaps the Dysons of the world. That's not to say that these are like nasty people. I'm not talking about their personality. I'm talking about their management style. You know, it's like you need someone who says this is what we're doing and this is the direction that we're going in because then you can't be. You, the ability to be political about it is greatly lessened, I think. There's a lot of, there's a lot of nuance in that, in that, though, I feel, that we could go into because I've also heard you talk about the importance of in your own um, your own career development and seeking a plural plur- gosh I'm now I'm having trouble get my words out plurality plurality <laughs> of opinions you know seeking yeah. seeking a broad range of perspectives before making decisions so you know when you talk about business leaders that are uh, dictatorial in their approach I know you mentioned that you're not saying that they're not open to feedback but that brings to mind you know certain other uh, characters throughout history that um, you know we we shall um, not name, but that those those characteristics don't tend to lend themselves to favourable views from most people. So, what is it that is? What's the subtle distinction here between having a strong vision and being able to wield that in such a way that it negates some of the poorer political instincts of people, mm-hmm. while still giving them enough autonomy in their ability mm-hmm. to make decisions? Because you can't bear there to make every single decision for them categorically and perhaps dictatorial is the wrong is not the right word in fact it's almost certainly not the right word what i'm trying to convey is the sense that you have very clear direction and you have very clear vision and you have an unwillingness i think to compromise on the fundamentals of those things i think i would say and that that could appear that could appear dicta- dictatorial. Like, that's a, it's perhaps the wrong word because that word is very heavy with, with, with politics and weight and, and societal issues. And I, and I, I certainly didn't mean to suggest that that's a, a virtue in 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 business to 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 be that way. That's not. I think one of the points I was making earlier is that there often isn't a right or wrong way. There are ways that work, and then something changes and suddenly they don't work or something can appear to be a virtue and then it turns out that it's, it's actually not. And some people are lucky and other people are unlucky. But I do think that there is there are certain businesses that have succeeded because their leadership is monomaniacal. Perhaps that's a better word. Uh, about quality or about what they're there to do or about the type of things that they're going to do, about what passes muster and what doesn't. Perhaps that's a better word than dictatorial. I'm not sure monomaniacal is a, is a virtue either, to, to be honest. But but it but it does it does happen, right? Like uh, there's a great book on this, Creative Selection, by a guy called Ken Cosiendo, who's talking about the design processes at Apple, and he's saying that basically every every major feature on the iPhone or every feature on the iPhone iPad was demoed, was done as a demo to to Steve Jobs, and he would say whether he was happy with it or not. You know, I mean, that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. Other people are making the decisions, but he's taking ultimate accountability for whether it meets their quality or, or brand or whatever. And, and I don't think, but he was actually, you know, this is one of the most fascinating things actually about a lot of these companies is that most people massive are, are wrong all the time. Right. So like speaking of which didn't want to have an app store, like it's a good job. They managed to talk him around on that, you know, otherwise, you know, that supports like a trillion dollars worth of trading a year or something now. The app store, like Google tried to sell themselves for a million bucks, you know, when they were fairly early on, you know, Xerox Park Innovation Lab basically in- invented the graphical user interface, the mouse, Ethernet, and the the technology that Adobe took to market and didn't seem to see much value in them. Like, we're all capable of misjudging the value of, of, of things, and we're all capable of, of getting that wrong, and we're all capable of... Um, needing to change direction. So it is, it's often the case in business, I find that actually you need to hold two opposite concepts and accept that they're both true, right? Like, like you can, you, you need to accept that you might be wrong, but you also need to act confidently and assertively. Otherwise you're never going to get anywhere. You need to be humble, but you need to be, need to be confident. 
you need to say it like everything matters, but it's what matters right now in this in this context, right? That I think is the is the challenge. You know, and you need to be able to hold two opposing ideas in your mind at the same time and acknowledge that they might both be right. And I think that's something that people generally struggle with. My, you know, all of us struggle with to a degree. In part of your work with your book, The Grid, I understand that you have run a number of workshops with organisations and that one of the things that has surprised you the most in terms of the largest barrier that you've witnessed people struggle with when using The Grid and we won't go into the into the specific details of the grid today because we just, uh, frankly, unfortunately, don't have time. But you've said that the biggest barrier that you've observed to effective decision making is ambiguity. So, what you clarified there around uh, what you were saying earlier around the uh, monomaniacal nature of these some of these leaders made a lot of sense in terms that they have this tension between knowing exactly what they want to achieve but still being willing to be wrong in the pursuit mm-hmm. of it. But it's that mm-hmm. having having that clarity over what we're all here to do that mm-hmm. seems to me at least to speak to solving in part this problem that you've observed of people just not knowing exactly even how to define the problem and where to get going on it. Yeah, that's that's certainly true. We've all, we've observed that if you go typically go two or three rungs down the ladder in an organisation, a vision that might be very clear at the top is nobody has any idea by the time you get down to the middle what they're trying to do. And I think also it's it's made exponentially harder by trying to do far too much. You know, I, I, th- I think that there aren't many situations where people can benefit from doing less, doing far fewer projects or far fewer initiatives and just concentrating on the ones that are at the highest leverage points in terms of their ability to change profitability or value, customer value or the brand perception or whatever it might be. And just saying, we're not doing the rest of that. Like we're going to do a good job on five things a year and we're not going to do an all right job on 5,000 things a year. I don't know whether that's a pipe dream culturally, but, but I think that that there are so many people over the years who have, who have spoken to the power of just saying no to things. And I, and I think, you know, I've worked with, with a client recently where I observed this, this phenomenon. We're not, we're not working with them. Um, we're not working with them now, in part because I, I actually said I, we, I don't want to continue the, the relationship because I don't think it's productive for you and I don't think it's productive for us. But there's just so, they're attempting to change so much simultaneously with so many people involved across such sprawling programs. I just thought, you, you can't, it won't work. And and I might be wrong on that. You know, they might they might pull it off, but I... I, I think doing less and trying to do it better is is definitely a virtue. You know, clarity is is you can't do that unless you're clear. And and ambiguity. I actually think that back to this idea of politics. I think people thrive on ambiguity because there's so much wiggle room, right? And 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 when you start to get really specific about things, often people can be uncomfortable about that. And and I think you notice that in in the fundamental language and semantics of, of business. Like how many abstract nouns and verbs do we do we use in business jargon? It's almost all of them. Like we're going to transform. We're going to be we're going to create best in best in class or you know we're going to you know have an omni channel experience design thinking all of these all of these terms right i'm not saying that there's no substance to them and i'm not i'm not being cr- critical or cynical but i'm saying that a lot of the language that we use in our day to day lives in business is willfully ambiguous because it leaves margin for interpretation which to some people is good but it's actually not that good from the point of view of of making better decisions i think and actually achieving a goal. Like, I think it should, people should aspire to use the most crystalline and simplistic language that they can and communicate the idea as unambiguously as they, as they can. And uh, if you can't, if that's not possible, then, then there's work to be, to be done. That's my own. I mean, I've learned that from writing books is that people respond a lot better to, as I, as I often say, like, feed the hungry dog, not reduce the canine malnutrition deficit, right? Like one of those is clear and it's simple and anyone can do it. And the other like sounds businessy and important, but it's just pretty much nonsense. You know? mm. Yeah, there's almost this notion that people can hide in that ambiguity and not make decisions. There's also something in the word decision 
you know, it sounds like incision, uh, deduce, deduct. It's mm-hmm. a process of choosing a course of action and by virtue of doing so, abandoning other alternatives. And I think there's a fundamental insecurity people have in committing to a direction and it's often easier to hide in that analysis. And I think you've spoken about that in the past as well, that this, and you used to do this, you spoke about this earlier too, you know, like overanalyze the situation where really it sounds like the only place you learn anything is after you commit and take that first step. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that's, yeah, I think that's true. And again, I'm not, I'm not in any way critical of, I mean, in a sense, I'm critical of the situation and, and I'm frustrated by ambiguous language and, and, and direction, but it's understandable. I, I understand where it comes from and I understand how it happens. And, and it's not like I'm, I'm railing against it. I just think that clarity and concision and learning to communicate effectively is a business skill that almost everybody can can improve and, and, and work on, whether you're writing a proposal, whether you're delivering a presentation, whether you're setting out a strategy, like words matter. And I think the, the having committed my own faux pas earlier talking about being dictatorial, like I'm reminded <laughs> the words matter in saying that, like words, words do matter and, and they carry, like they literally carry our, 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 our message, right? So we should be as, as clear and intentional in our use of them as we, as we can. Like, I think that's, that's hugely important. The other thing I would say that, that we that is kind of tangential to this that was a, a a lesson to me is that in most organizations, actual decision making power is concentrated in a very very small number of hands. That's something that surprised me. It, it, like I thought that the bigger the co- corporation was, the more discretionary decision making power people in the middle or uh, certainly away from the apex would have. But I'm not sure that that's actually true. And that's something that that. It, you know, it was just a another thing that I've I've learned and been reflecting on. It's like, wow, almost everybody, almost everyone in an organisation is a influencer more than they are an actual decider, and that that's that's something that you know I've just learned to be mindful of in terms of how I try and navigate with in, in my own working practice. You know, Matt, just being mindful of something myself, which is the time we have together. I just want to bring us down to a close now with a final question. Sure. So you you actually closed another recent interview with some advice for people and you said, and I'll quote you again one last time, be a host in life, not a guest, not just in your business affairs, but also also in your personal life. So Mm -hmm. as we bring this conversation down to its close, tell me, Matt, why is it important to be a host in life? Well, this is a, a, a chabarism that I've stolen from my, my co-author. That's It's one of his crucial tenets, and I learned a lot from him about that. And I've also learned a lot from observing very successful people, not just successful people, but happy people, that they tend to be hosts in life and not a, not a guest. They're not looking at what's in it for me right now. They're looking at how do I create value for other people? How do I share what I know? How do I make people feel welcome? How do I make people feel valued? How do I listen and tend to people's individual needs? And I think it's because social capital has greater influence than financial capital in the long run and in the short run, and it certainly precedes it. And it, almost anyone can build their social capital by being a host in life, you know, by doing things for other people. And we also feel good about it. Like it's in our it's in our DNA to want to do that. And and I think I just think it's a really simple concept that anyone can understand that is really, really powerful in terms of like your contribution to society, in terms of your contribution to your social groups. And I, even though it's not a quid pro quo thing, like, oh, I'm going to be your host because then you're going to be my host. It doesn't work like that. It's like, it's just that if you put enough good out into the world, it, it comes back around and... I, I fully believe that to be true. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the people that I think of most fondly uh, and the people who I, I know who are most successful in life are are hosts in life. They're not guests. And that that's a really just a simple, pithy statement that, that we can all reflect on and think, how can I be more of a host? You know, how can I put other people together? No, it's not just about me. It's like, oh, I know A and I know B. They might benefit from... From, from from getting together, right? Like just thinking about yourself as a host is enormously, enormously powerful, I think. 
certainly a good place for us to end and for people, including myself, to think about. Matt, thank you. I've really enjoyed today's conversation. It's been a great way to close out my week. Thank you for sharing your stories and insights with me today and also for being such a positive role model for designers but also people more generally who want to learn, who want to grow, want to develop and want to also develop a command for business when that might not be their original wheelhouse. Mm. Well, thank you so much. It's been a a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed it too. My pleasure as well. Matt, if people want to find out more about you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, I'd say just connect on LinkedIn. Um, Pretty easy to find. I look like this, but I'm wearing glasses in my my picture. I've got a website. It's matt-watkinson.com. The agency is methodical.io. I'm easy to find and and get hold of, and I, I, I certainly welcome hearing from anybody. So, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to be on your platform. Thanks, Matt. And to everyone who's tuned in, it's been great having you here as well. Everything we've covered will be in the show notes, including where you can find Matt Methodical, all of Matt's books as well. Everything we've spoken about will all be chaptered. If you've enjoyed the show and you want to hear more great conversations like this with world-class leaders in UX design and product management, don't forget to leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, and also pass it along to someone else that you feel would get value from these conversations at depth. If you want to reach out to me, there's a link to my LinkedIn profile at the bottom of the show notes as well or you can head on over to thespaceinbetween.co.nz that's thespaceinbetween.co.nz and until next time keep being brave